started working here too later, which is something that my dad hasn't taught me anything about surveying. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm going to start with the. Uh, I'm going to start with what you guys know, okay, and we're going to build from there, okay. So let's talk about yes. Really quick, Derek. Uh, sorry, guys. I'm going to interrupt the meeting for just one quick second. Uh, Greg is asking about if we have connections. That can, anybody that can do utility locate in the Bay Area. I do. All right. Does so Danny know who they are? They can, and he can send me the contact info. Yeah. Let's. So, uh, he's doing the meeting. Actually. Uh, can you do me a favor and send Brian Joseph's contact? Joseph, yeah. JT? He's, up, he's off the phone. Oh. I can do it. I can I, click I, on. Oh, yeah. You got it? Too. Oh, but is he, do you have Brian's number? He probably yeah. don't. Do you have Brian's number? Or does he have Brian's number? Hang on. We'll just do it right do now. Do you have Brian's number? Yeah. You can send it to me on Teams, too. So. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, I'm just staring into your pretty eyes right now, Landon. Yep. Don't don't get don't get spellbound. Let's see. This is going to Brian. So JT is uh, one of the locators I train. And uh, who who you want to talk to is JT's boss. All right. Uh, but have him um, have him call Joseph and just tell him he's a just tell have him call Joseph. Tell him. He's a friend of Landon's and that he needs locating in the bay and then Joseph will get him to the right person. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Sorry for interrupting, guys. That's okay. That was important. Okay, so let's start with what you guys know. So we got a total station. Okay, set up over a point. I totally am not drawing my total station right. All right. Okay, got a total station set up over a point. Okay. And we want to measure some buildings. Okay. So I'm going to tell you guys how old I was, how old I am. Okay. When I started surveying, there was only one way to measure those buildings. But well, two ways if you count a tape measure. Okay. But there was only one way to do it. You had to go put a prism up here on a rod and then you shot the laser. You ready for my sound effect? Pew! Right? Hit the glass, comes back. Okay? Angela does that all day, all the time, when he's in the field. Okay? So then, now, it, when, I, when I was a surveyor, you had to manually sight. You turn every building corner you wanted to shoot, you turn it, and then you have to walk over there, put the prism up, and shoot it. Okay. The next thing we got, so that's kind of step one. Okay? Okay, the next thing that they came up with is they came up with what was called a reflectorless EDM. Which is super cool when you're an old guy. Okay, because now you don't need a prism. You can actually just look at something and shoot it. Okay, so that does two things. Okay, it gets rid of Angelo. I don't need him anymore, right? Don't need a Robin. Okay, and all of a sudden I can shoot building corners that I couldn't reach before with a rod. Right? I can shoot the top of the building now. Because I don't have to physically put a prism on it. You did that at dot. Did that a dot. Okay, but that's still you still have to turn manually sight what you want to shoot. Okay? But that was an improvement. Right? Not to mention the fact that when you have a prism, it's hard to get your shot right on the building, isn't it, Angelo? Yeah. Because you got the prism bumping up against the building. Right? So in most cases the reflectorless shot is more accurate. Okay, so that was kind of iteration two. All right, after a few years of having the reflectorless EDM, some really smart guys got together and they said, hey, what if you didn't have to manually cite that reflectorless EDM? What if you could just have that piece of equipment just manually shoot 10,000 reflectorless shots from the setup? And you just set it up and you just have it go, one degree, right? And then you turn it, one degree, right? And that's actually literally what the first laser scanner did. Like you could watch it go, right? And it, that's what it was doing. It was sending out a reflectorless shot, okay? And what that gives you is what we call a point cloud, okay? Now, when you first started, 
The very first scanner I had was as big as Austin, right? And it like took two car batteries and they lasted about 30 minutes. And it like, I'm not joking, you'd set that thing up and it would scan, like it would take it 45 minutes to get a scan, right? Because that's what it was doing. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 right? Okay, now you get a scanner that is as big as that video camera and runs all day on one battery and it can do a scan in two minutes, right? So that's what happens with technology, right? It gets faster and it gets better, okay? But that's what it is. It's a reflectorless EDM. So what they have on a laser scanner is, and you can actually see this on some scanners, you can see this. There's a little mirror right here, okay, that spins. Okay, and there's this little part in here that has a laser, and it shoots the laser. It shoots the laser at the mirror. Millions of times a second. Right, and as the mirror spins, it's shooting it out the laser beams like this. Okay? It goes to the sky. It does. Yeah, it absolutely does go to the sky. Okay, now, you only get a point where there's a return. So it actually is a little more complicated. What it does is it shoots the laser, and the laser comes back, and it measures how long that takes. Okay, so when, it, when it's looking up, when the thing's looking up, if it shoots into the open sky, it never gets a return. So you don't get a point there. Okay? Okay, that's how laser scanning works. Okay, so essentially what we get is we get a 3D photocopy. It's pretty cool. You're just made up of, of points. points. Millions of points. Okay, it's a 3D photocopy. That's what it is. Now, I want to talk to you about the two kinds of laser scanners there are. Okay, we're going to talk about how do you figure out where that crap is at in the world. And then we'll talk about some of the limitations of the technology. Because you might be thinking right now, well, why don't we just laser scan everything? That's a good question. Right? Okay. So. There's two ways a laser scanner works. There's two kinds of laser scanners. There's what they call phase-based and time of flight. Okay. So, there's two ways you can measure the distance of the laser, the distance from the from the mirror to whatever the laser's bouncing off of. Okay. So the first way is the easier way. That's called time of flight. Okay. So they just they measure what time the, the signal leaves. So what time the laser leaves the mirror, and then they measure what time the laser comes back, arrival. Okay, they take that time, they divide it by two, and they multiply it by the speed of light. Okay, why do they divide by two? It's going down and back. You got to cut that in half to get the distance, right? Okay. Now, how accurate does you how accurate do you have to measure time if you're multiplying stuff by the speed of light? Really accurate, like to the millionth of a second, because light moves really fast, right? So if you have a little tiny error in your clock, you get a really big you get a really big error in your distance. Okay. Now, not only does it have to measure the distance, okay, but it measures what position the mirror is in at that second because that gives you the angle, right? If you think this is the plumb line of the instrument, we need to know not only the distance from the mirror to the surface, but we also need to know what this angle is to calculate a 3D point over here, right? So it measures the angle of the mirror and the time of flight. And it's just a, it's a tr literally a trig problem. It's a Kogo problem to come up with that X, Y, Z, okay? Now, it measures not only, if this is looking at the side, it's, it's measuring that angle of the mirror, and then if you're looking down on the instrument like this, it also has to measure where the mirror is rotating like a clock, right? So there's two angles. There's up and down, and there's left and right, and then the distance, okay? So the horizontal angle, the vertical angle, and the distance gives you a 3D point, just like a total station, okay? Okay, so that's the first way. Now, the second way is exactly the same. They measure the position of the mirror to get those two angles, okay, but the distance is a little bit different. So that, <clears throat> the first way is called time of flight, and the second way is called phase-based, because all light moves in a wave, sine wave, okay? 
Now, depending on the frequency of the light, you know this distance. It's a physics problem. Okay? So what you do is you send the beam out and have it come back. You count how many peaks or valleys there are, multiply by that distance, and that gives you the distance of the from the mirror to the target. That's called phase-based. Okay? Now, why do we care? We care because there's some important differences between the two kinds of instruments. Okay? And Brian's going to help me with this because I'll probably forget. I'll get, them, I'll get them backwards. So time of flight, okay, is can, you, can, you can shoot farther, you can collect data farther from the instrument so it has what we call longer range, okay, and it is slightly more accurate, but it takes longer. So it's slower, okay. Phase base, shorter range, okay, a little bit less accurate, but a lot faster. Did I get that right, Brian? You are correct. Okay, all right. So, so that has so when you're going to go buy a laser scanner, do you want to know what kind you're getting? Yes. Okay, so let me give you an example. If we're outside, if we want to use our laser scanner to do outside topos, okay? Versus a company that wants to scan the inside of shopping malls. Okay? So if we if we're what 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 thing would we do of those two more than likely? We do outside. Okay, so what kind of scanner do we want? Time of flight or phase based? Time of flight, because we want longer range, right? A little more accurate, even though it's a little slower. If we were gonna, if all we were gonna do is scan the inside of buildings, we'd probably get phase based, because it's way faster, and you don't care about range. You can only see from wall to wall, right? Okay, now there's some gotchas. I want to come back to the gotchas. I want to tell you about. <clears throat> Well, we can talk. We'll talk about the gotchas, and then we'll talk about how do we get this, how do we get these point clouds onto a project coordinate system. Okay, so here's some of the gotchas with scanning. You still there, Michaela? She went to sleep. Yeah, I am. Oh, all right. She's still there. Okay, so there's some gotchas for scanning. Okay, so rain. You can't scan in the rain. You can't scan in the fog. You can't scan in the dust. Okay, why? Hail. Hail, yeah. Hey, right. what happened? Why? Just like that. Yeah, you, you'll see the droplets. I've actually scanned, gotten scans in the fog, and you can see the droplets in the air, right? So if the fog's thick enough, your, your laser never makes it to the wall or the ground because it's bouncing off of the fog, right? So this is what we call, this is an environmental constraint. Right? Just like you can't fly UAV in strong wind, you can't scan in the fog. Right? That doesn't sound like a big deal unless you work in the Delta in Stockton. And then it's foggy for six months out of the year. Right? And that could cause problems. Okay, the other thing is compared to a total station, so I would say with a regular total station, we can see somewhere between 1,200 and 2,200 feet. Now, we don't typically survey that long of a distance, but we, we could. Okay, you could you could go almost a half a mile. Okay, and very accurate. Okay, now reflectorless EDM, the reflectorless EDM on the Nikon. So this is with the prism. Okay. I don't want to talk to anybody. Okay, with the reflectorless with the reflectorless EDM on the Nikon, I'm really surprised at how far that thing can shoot. If you're shooting to a good surface. So a flat, smooth surface, you can get you can get 800 feet with a reflectorless EDM. Okay. Now, when you're either it doesn't matter whether you're using a reflectorless EDM in a total station or a scanner, the surface that you're trying to measure matters. Okay. So you have a longer range to a bright metal surface than you do a dark than you do a tree trunk. Okay. Because what do you think happens to a laser beam when it hits a tree trunk? It gets absorbed and scattered. Does that make sense? If you shoot the side of a sheet metal building, what happens to the laser? Return. It stays nice and tight, goes right back to the sensor, right? Because it's a nice, flat, smooth surface. But when the laser hits the tree trunk, it just it scatters. It gets absorbed and scattered, right? Now, that doesn't mean you can't. You can still see the tree in the laser scan, but you got to be close, right? Your range to a smooth object is is better than your range, is longer than your range to a rough object. 
okay? So that's important. Okay, so to a smooth object, that Nikon will probably shoot 800 feet. Okay, do you know what the typical range is on a phase-based scanner? 300 feet, probably. Okay, so it's, it's a one quarter, 25% of how far we can see with a gun. Okay, so what's one of the reasons we don't just scan everything? Yeah, it's a lot more setups. If you only need a few shots, you take it with the total station. Okay? So you only scan when you, when you want to collect a large amount of data, right? If all you need is a few key shots, you're, it's quicker with the total station because you're not going to have as many setups. Okay? All right. The other reason we don't scan everything is because you can take, if I send Angelo out, if Angelo and Austin went out and I told them, Topo this parking lot in this building, right? They could go Topo, let's say they collected, I don't know, you could probably Topo this whole building and parking lot with a thousand shots. Right? Maybe less than that, maybe 500 shots. Okay, let's say they had a thousand shots. Okay, and they download that file off the Nikon onto a USB. Do you know how big that file is? That CSV file with those shots? It's like five kilobytes. Okay, it's super small. Okay, if they went out and scanned this parking lot in this building, you probably couldn't fit the file on a USB stick. Right? It's the data is exponent exponentially larger. Okay, so the other reason we don't scan everything is because I don't want to like carry around external hard drives everywhere I go. Right? So there's a major there's a major trade off there. Okay. All right. So that's why we don't scan everything. Now. We're renting a scanner next week because Brian's got a job where we need to model the inside and outside of a warehouse building. Do we want to do that with the Nikon? No, Angela would be there for three months, yeah. right? So we're going to be, Brian thinks we can probably scan the, the whole interior of this warehouse we can probably scan in a day, two days max, okay? And like we're going to have a 3D photocopy of that building. And you bring it back, you put it on the computer, you can measure whatever you want. Okay? All right, now, let's talk about what makes us different from every other idiot with a scanner. Okay? Because there is a difference. Okay? You don't have to be a surveyor to buy a scanner. If you want, you go to CSDS in Sacramento, they will sell you a scanner right now. They would sell Jace a scanner. What does Jace know about surveying or scanning? what he's learned in the last 20 minutes. They would gladly sell him a scanner. Okay, so I want you to understand what makes us different. Okay, so you set up a scanner. And you scan the inside of a building. Okay, now you can open up that point cloud and you can measure how tall is this wall, how far is it from this wall to this wall, very accurately to, you know, within a hundredth or two. You can measure all that information. Okay, so let's just say, now that is that useful? Absolutely, yes, that's useful. Okay, but I'm going to give you a different scenario. Okay, so now we've got a building. Okay, and it's got four rooms in it. One, two, three, four. Okay, and you set up inside the middle of each one of those rooms and you scan it. Okay. That's great, but now if you want to, if this is in one scan, let me draw it with a different color. If this is in one scan, and this is a scan, and this is a scan, and this is a scan, you can't measure the distance from this wall to that wall. Because it's two separate scans. Okay, so to fit scans together, what they usually call that is they call it registration. Okay. Okay, now. Let's just say Jace buys his scanner, right? He could do these scans and he could take some basic measurements and he doesn't have to know anything about registration, but he can only me measure what's in one scan. All right, now Jace takes the Landon Blake 15 minute scan, scanning crash course, okay? And they'll teach him how to register one scan to another. It's called cloud to cloud. Cloud to cloud registration, right? So if you guys can imagine if we've got one scan of this side of the table and we can see this corner, 
And then we got another scan where we can see the same corner. The computer can line up these two, the two clouds, they just line up these two corners till they fit. Okay, that's called cloud to cloud registration. Okay, over short distances, it works pretty good. Okay, over long distances, it can get you in a lot of trouble. Okay, so here's what makes us different. So, you guys understand how cloud to cloud registration can fix this problem. Now you can measure from this wall to this wall because you've got all the scans glued together, right? Okay, that's where most scanning companies operate. Okay, here's where here's where being a life uh, being a land surveyor comes in handy. Okay, now three years later, you want to scan this building that you own across the street. Okay, three scans. Now you want to measure the distance from this wall to that wall on two buildings that are across the street. Even if you cloud the cloud register these two, can you do that? Can you make this measurement? No, you don't know where these two point clouds relate to each other. Okay, and if you're gonna try and cloud, let's say this is a long ways. Let's say this is, let's say it's 1200 feet. You know, we're on a university campus or a hospital or something. These two buildings are a long way apart. Okay, you, if you could go outside and scan. You could scan like that in, in a necklace, right? Chain of pearls or whatever, okay? But you try and go 1200 feet between two buildings, cloud to cloud, you're gonna get error. You're gonna be off a half a foot or a foot maybe. I've seen it, I've seen it be off a foot and a half in a thousand feet, cloud to cloud, okay? All right, but we don't have to worry about that because we've got Angelo. So what does Angelo do? Angelo goes out and he sets control. He sets control around both of the buildings and we GPS this control. We measure it with the total station and he gets the Nikon out and he shoots these four building corners. Shoots the four building corners of each building, even if that's all he did. He just did, do you know how to do that? Yep. He knows how to do that. I can send Angelo out tomorrow, he can do that. Right, all right, now we've got the four building corners of each of the two buildings and we've got these point clouds. Now what can we do with the point clouds? We can line them up to the buildings where they are in space. Now we can make that measurement because the two point clouds are in relation to one, one another, right? That's what makes surveyors different from all the other guys that buy laser scanners, right? So when this job that we're doing in Reno, we're not just surveying the inside of the building. Brian, what else are we surveying? We're surveying the exterior of the building and all the ground, the 50 acre parcel. The outside of the the outside of the building, the roof of the building, and the 50 acre site, and that's all going to fit together because Angelo is going to be there with the total station. Okay, that's what makes us different. Okay, now how do you do that? How do you get a point cloud onto a total onto a project coordinate system? What we call project coordinate system. So I'm going to give you a couple different ways. Okay, I'm going to start with the old guy way. All right. So when I first started scanning. You had to set targets up in each scan, and they were usually a big ball, like a basketball or a grapefruit. They were plastic. They're called spheres. You'd set those up. Okay, and here's why you use a sphere. Because no matter which side you scan a sphere from, it's always the same distance from the outside of the sphere to the center. Right? That's why we use spheres. Okay? And so like I would literally go out on scanning jobs and my whole job the whole day would be moving spheres. I got set up the first four for the first scan and then while my party chief was doing the first scan I'd be setting up the spheres for the next scan. And then he'd move the scanner and I'd run over and I'd grab the spheres from the first scan and I'd run them over to the third scan as fast as I could run because he was right behind me the whole day. That's why that's a good job for Angelo. Okay? Alright, and what you do is these spheres get set up over control points that you've shot with the total station. Okay? So the spheres are like a backsite? They're like a backsite for scanning. Yes. Excellent. Okay. All right. And so then when you come into the office, you take each scan and you, you know which spheres you survey and you line up every scan piece by piece. It's a pain in the butt. It's called registration. Okay. Then a little bit later, so I used to, you have to go into the scan and pick the sphere. Okay, a little bit later the software got smart enough it would just find your spheres for you. Okay, but you still had to do all that running around. Okay. 
All right, so then somebody finally got smart, and they said, hey, why don't we just let these guys set up the scanner over a control point? Okay, so now they've got scanners that work like a total station. You set it up over one control point, and you set up one sphere instead of six. You just set one up over your back site, and it works just like a total station does. Then Now you got rid of all these other spheres. You don't have to do that anymore. Okay, now I don't know, Brian, does RX-7 set up over control like this? You can set it up over control or you can resect. So we'll probably do, be doing a lot of resection. Yeah, so resect is where you have two points instead of one. You can resect like that. And then your scanner doesn't have to be over a point. Okay, but the, you don't have to carry around eight, eight spheres all day long. Okay. So that's part of what makes us different, right, is our ability to do this. Okay. So if you do this right, if you set up in the field over control, you don't have to do any work in the office. When you bring, you download your data, it's already in the right place. You just start measuring stuff. Okay, and you guys will see that. We're gonna show you. We'll have the software here. We'll pull up the point clouds and you guys will be able to look at it. Now you guys have already kind of seen this if you've watched us in our UAV software, right? Because you can also create point clouds from the UAV images, right? They're not as good. They're a little fuzzier, but so you guys kind of have some idea, okay? All right, could you answer some basic test questions about laser scanning? Yeah? All right. Angela, you ready to go run the scanner in Fernley, right? Yep. <laughs> well, uh, 